All right, everybody, thank you for joining the core and backhaul network section of, uh, of the summit. We've tried to put together a few topics that we think are going to be relevant for designing core and backhaul networks in 2020 and going forward. I think we have a couple of great speakers that have a ton of depth of knowledge on this that they can they can offer. So uh, before we dive into the content uh, and introductions, just want to remind you to stick around at the end for the code. Uh, we do have on the play to win tab on the left there competitions and prizes running all the time for the event. So if you wait to the end, you get a code that gives you 25 points and you might win something cool. So hold out for that. Um, and with that, I'm going to like to introduce everybody on the panel. Um, so my name is Dan Seaman. I'm co-founders of Perseem. Um, I've worked with internet providers basically my whole life, I'm now focused on fixed uh, wireless providers with Perseem. Um, we also have Nick joining us today. Uh, Nick's been involved in the network industry in, in varying roles since 1997, and he currently works on the network planning and architecture team for a major international research network provider. Uh, he specializes in service provider backbone networks and also dabbles in broadband technologies, instrumentation monitoring data centers Linux and all the cool stuff in between you can find his blog on forwardingplane.net and if you searched for IPv6 stuff and other things in the past you may have already been to that site and, and now you know Nick uh, we also have Kevin speaking uh, Kevin's a consulting network architect with 18 years of experience he's a co-founder of IP architects a global consulting firm that specializes in white box integration and design. Uh, he's designed to build networks on every continent except Antarctica and is really holding out hope for the day that the penguins actually need Netflix someday. So with that, I would like to, to pass it off with Nick. Uh, we are going to kind of talk about uh, IPv6 first, then we're going to talk about optical um, rates and, and interfaces, and then move into network overlays and underlays. Uh, at the end of the session, we'll have a Q&A session as well. Um, a bit of time between us as the speakers and then also moving on to the online platform as well the, the, the text-based chat that will stay open for a half hour after the session so with that uh, nick uh, please go ahead hey everybody uh, we're going to talk about uh, all of our favorite subjects today um, we're going to start with why you should deploy ipv6 or why it's a good idea for you to start your ipv6 journey um before we get started, I want to get uh, a couple things out of the way, dispel some myths. Um, these are some of the more common um, detriments, I guess, that people use to, uh, you know, to keep from deploying IPv6, and and I want to address those right out of the gate. Um, the first one, and one of the more common ones that I hear, uh, and again, I've been doing IPv6 since you know 2002, 2003, um, is that no one's asking for it. And while I've said we're going to bust the myths here, that's not actually a myth. That's true. Nobody's going to ask for it. They never will. Your customers don't even know what it is. But that should not de deter you from deploying it. And we're going to get into some reasons why. Um, another myth is that there's no content. Um, also incorrect. Um, and, and another myth is that it's too complicated and, and, and it's insecure. Uh, all of these things are sort of the FUD, uh, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that have wrapped up and sort of bound IPv6 uh, from being deployed for a lo very long time. And I want to address those one at a time. Um, first, I want to talk about the advantages, right? So we talked about all the reasons why people say they shouldn't do it or they're not going to do it or they don't want to do it. Um, but one of the biggest advantages is that it provides something that we seem to, as an industry, forgotten is really important and sort of fundamental to how the global internet works. It provides end-to-end -end connectivity. Um, and what this means for providers is that it, it gives you something that is foundational to how the protocols that we all rely on for our livelihood um, it's how they were intended to be deployed, right? It's fundamental and very important for one of your loudest constituencies, the gaming community. Um, providing end-to-end -end connectivity is a huge deal for them for a number of different reasons that I'm sure we're all very familiar with. It's also really important uh, for the business community. Site-to-site -site VPNs, exposing ex external services are all really important for the business community. And it's very hard to do without having the end-to-end -end connectivity. So as an example, if we think about what end-to-end -end connectivity really is, think about using a translator to speak a language. You go to another country or whatever, and you may not be fluent in the language. So let you use something like Google Translator or one of the you know, vocal clients that you can speak into and it will say things in another language. If you use the example, I would like to stream the movie Ghostbusters, you put that into 
uh, Google Translate, and I use Ghostbusters because it's my favorite movie, um, it'll translate that into Italian or whatever language you choose. Um, and then if you want to translate it back, you say you paste the exact same text in, it detects Italian, and it tells you, I would like to stream Ghostbusters movies. Now, those aren't exactly the same thing, right? You get the point of it, but you've broken that end-to-end -end connectivity. Uh, and, and using translation devices and other middle boxes, as opposed to using, say, IPv6 or raw IPv4 is functionally equivalent. And you can look at the diagram here below. You can see how much cleaner the bottom one is than the top one. Um, now, that's a big deal, especially to the two communities that I mentioned before. But the gaming community is going to be very vocal about things like this. They're not going to know what it is, or they may if they're very savvy. But... It's an important concept that they need to be able to provide their service and likely their gaming consoles are going to tunnel that traffic, which is outside of your control at that point. So that's a big reason why end-to-end -end connectivity is, is very important. Um, it also, I will argue that it reduces your network complexity um, for a number of different reasons. The biggest one being that there's less state tracking. So anytime you have a middle box of any kind, whether it's a stateful firewall that's using public IP on both sides and it's bridging or whatever, or it's doing address translation or port address translation, there is a level of state that needs to be tracked for that entire connection, for every connection. Um, that's complicated. Now, a lot of us sort of hand wave over that because we don't actually have to see it happen, but there's a lot of really complicated pieces and parts that are involved in tracking that state and it's resource hungry. So it's also, um, in my opinion, a security risk that you need to be aware of because state exhaustion is a real thing that gets exploited and it breaks networks. Um, so the fewer or lack thereof translation points that you get when deploying IPv6 is an advantage. Um, it's also easier for tracking resources. For those of us that have to track who has what IP address and when, you know, for DMCA complaints or whatever, just user accountability, having to maintain the table of NAT translations is very time consuming, resource intensive. With IPv6, you don't have to keep track of that. You only have to keep track of who has what prefix delegation. So it's a little bit less cumbersome to deal with um, and thereby you know, reducing your complexity of your network. Now this one is a little contentious, right? Superior access to content. Now, we dispelled the myth earlier that there was no content on IPv6, right? That's been untrue for a very long time. All of the major content providers support IPv6 at this point. And if you move your traffic over, you start presenting IPv6 to your customers, you will start seeing a large amount, especially of media consumption traffic, moving over to IPv6 because things like Netflix support it now. Um, gaming consoles will always prefer it. And like I said earlier, they will tunnel it in some cases, um, which makes it outside of your realm of control. Um, and most content consumption devices today are based on an embedded Linux. Um, that's Linux has supported IPv6 forever. So a lot of them, not all of them, there's some notable exceptions that don't, but most of the content consumption devices, Apple TVs and what have you, they're totally v6 compliant. Um, another uh, particular advantage that you can get um, is that since IPv6 is a separate routed protocol, it runs as ships in the night with IPv4. So IPv6 paths may be different and less congested than the normal IPv4 transit paths. That gives you the advantage of potentially a shorter or less congested path for the traffic. Um, it also allows uh, folks that may not have uh, the ability to do robust traffic engineering with their upstream providers, like say present BGP communities to influence traffic. Um, it, it gives you the ability to sort of sledgehammer your traffic engineering in by using disaggregated prefixes. So you can, you can break IPv6 apart as long as it's larger than a slash 48, it'll be accepted by the global table um, and your upstream provider, assuming that you've worked out those uh, prefix filters with them. So there's some, uh, there's some ways that you can, you can use these things to your advantage to provide superior access to content too. Now, this inevitably always comes up. Um, why do I wanna run 
IPv4 and IPv6. Can't I just go straight to IPv6? Sure, you absolutely can do that. However, um, think about these things and food for thought here. The supportability, complexity, and user experience is going to be key to what you're trying to do. In IPv6 only, there's still going to have to be access to IPv4 for the legacy systems that just don't do IPv6. Um, so you're going to end up with a translation table of some kind, NAT64, IVI, whatever, um, in order to be able to bridge that gap. So the the facto standard is really dual stacking, and it doesn't matter if you dual stack your V4 with whatever public IP space you have or your RFC 1918 or your CGN space, doesn't really make a difference. The point is that the easiest path to transition is just to run both, um, and that's what most providers will do. Uh, by and large, it's the largest majority of them dual stack everything. So, I, test, I talked about a little bit of this earlier, this sort of recap here. Um, dual stack is sort of the, the de facto standard, right? You know, there's some big networks that do IPv6 only. I believe T-Mobile's mobile network is IPv6 only in the US. I'm not sure about overseas. Um, but IPv4, IPv6 dual stack has very good support. There's a lot of documentation. As I mentioned earlier, it runs as ships, the protocols run as ships in the night. So you can do multi-topology between them. You can have your IPv6 take one path, your IPv4 take another path. You can do traffic engineering in that way if you choose to. Um, IPv6, IPv4 dual stack is battle tested. It's been around for a very long time. Um, and there's a lot of, like I said, a lot of documentation. We know how it works. We know what to expect. There's a huge community out there of people that can support it. Um, and the, the real, the real takeaway here and the hidden gem in all of it is that when you do dual stack, if you do it well, no one even knows you added IPv6. Your clients probably won't notice if you enable it and you control the CPE, their client hardware will start to pick up v6 addresses, their iPads, their Android tablets, their laptops, whatever. It will all start to just pick up and prefer IPv6 and you're done. And they probably are none the wiser. Uh, and that's the really beautiful thing. And it's really nice when that happens when you deploy it. Um, and I think that a lot of people that I've talked to and a lot of networks that I've deployed with IPv6, it's largely been uneventful other than building the backbone and the client access. The V6 traffic just starts to happen and there's very little as far as support calls because no one really knows that it happened and it just works. Um, so if you're interested in doing some of this, um, there's a lot of resources out there, like I said. Um, here's the couple of links to things that I found useful, some stuff that I've written myself, things that I've used personally. The IPv6 fundamental stuff that Hurricane Electric offers is very good, very comprehensive. A um, couple of videos that are done and some Q and A's. So if you have any questions, you know, you can feel free to reach out to me or hit any of these resources here and you should be in pretty good shape. And from here, we're going to skip into something a little bit different. Um, we're going to shift gears and start talking about physical layer. Uh, we're going to talk about the conundrum of interface speeds here. Uh, and this is something that is equally, probably more complicated, in my opinion, than even the protocol stack. Um, so where we are now is that Ethernet is the de facto standard, right? We're all pretty much deploying Ethernet. There may be in other countries, you see some ATM and some other, you know, packet over sonnet and things like that still exists, frame relay and whatever, but by and large, ethernet has emerged as what we're all running. Uh, and there's a lot of different options here, right? You know, the smaller providers doing 100 meg, one gig, 10 gig, whatever. Um, you've got options for 40 gig. You can get a lot of this stuff on gray market. You know, you see 40 gig mostly in the data center space or the older telecom gear before 100 gig was available. And then you've got some emerging market stuff like the 25 gig and 50 gig and even the 100 gig and even there's four and 800 gig now. So it's really um, sort of just eclipsed everything else as the transport mechanism that we've all sort of come to rely on. Um, now, what we want to think about here is, you know, if you look back at the slide, you can see, you know, there's a lot of different options here, right? And sometimes it can be overwhelming in, in trying to figure out what is the right one for me, right? 
what's the right one for WISP A or WISP B or ISP Z? And the answer really is it's going to depend, right? You have to define your needs and your requirements, and you need to know that out of the gate before you get started. Um, and a big part of doing that is understanding your traffic patterns. That way you can do your bandwidth forecasting um, because faster isn't always better. It, it may be more advantageous to get more slower speed interfaces and aggregate them together, depending on where your bottleneck congestion may, is occurring or what's available in your area. A lot of this, excuse me, is going to be determined by what is available from the carriers as well. And another big one that I like to uh, call out is that port buffering is especially important where you have the, op the, the occurrence of a faster speed stepping down to a slower speed. Um, that's where things like the port buffers are going to become really important in longer lived flows. You'll see strange problems when you don't take them into account. And this is really common in the gray market area because a lot of what's out there is say a 10 gig uh, switch that has a 100 gig uplink or a 40 gig uplink, but there's it's a data center switch. So there's no port buffering. So it may not be the right tool for the job to put in as say, you know, a border router. Um, even though it can run the protocols and it has the interface speeds, that doesn't mean that it's the right tool and it has all the rest of the requirements for running in that environment. And those are things that need to be taken into account, especially when there are large long lived flows or distance is a factor. So long fat networks like backhaul links and stuff, it's particularly important uh, to take the buffers into account. Um, and this can get complicated and very quickly. Um, so there's, there's, there's a resource at the end that I'll point out that's uh, uh, particularly useful here. Um, and the reason being uh, for that last slide is that a common source of packet loss in these network devices is, is these network devices that can't handle the burst ability. So you'll start to see more of this behavior when your links become more saturated um, and you'll start to see packet drops and you know strange traffic issues that will manifest in ways that make the customers unhappy. Um, and, 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 you know, three to a thousand packets lost in a 10 second test, that's usually indicative of a uh, inappropriate packet buffer uh, somewhere along the path. And you have to check segment by segment to figure out where that exists. So where are we now when it comes to interfaces, right? Whatever happened to the, some of these, right? X-Pack, Zinpack, X2s. You know, I remember buying these when they were incredibly expensive and popping them into 6500s and whatever else needed them, 3750 Cisco's and other devices. Where are they now? And the answer is they're all on the gray market, right? This stuff is still very widely deployed, um, still a totally viable technology, as long as you understand that you'll probably have to self-insure it eventually. You may be able to buy new, new uh, optics out there and new uh, hardware to put them in but it's becoming more and more SFP plus based, smaller optics. Um, and so self-insuring with some of these older types of gray market gear is going to become more and more important as time goes on. Um, and as I talked about earlier, you know, be aware that some of this stuff is really data center gear and it may not necessarily be the best tool for an ISP, but again, you need to know your environment. So where are we now? We talked about some of the emerging technologies. Systems are now coming with 25 gig and 50 gig interfaces. Um, the network hardware is catching up. We're starting to see some of the um, WISP gear show up with these port speeds, which I think is a good thing um, for internal connectivity where you may not want to aggregate 10 gigs. Um, you may want to say, I want to run, I don't need 100, but I need more than 25, right? And you get a 50 gig interface. Um, and, and that, you know, is a good option to have, um, especially, you know, when you're looking at white box market and uh, also in some of the network virtualization world where you're running systems and, and processes like FRR or CHR on a white box system, you know, on a, on a, on a CPU based Intel, whatever platform, you know, it may have a 50 gig interface or a 25 gig interface. Um, and, and breaking these out, ports out is also an option at this point. A lot of these uh, newer technologies, you can buy uh, breakout cables. So if you have a 100 gig interface, you can break it out into 10, 10 gigs and only use two of them um, if, that's, if that's the model that you want to use. And, I, and, and the options are good. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of new options coming out out there. 
Um, again, the backhaul interfaces may become a little less flexible than what we had just talked about um, because I don't necessarily see carriers offering a 50 gig or a 25 gig um, managed service or a lease line. Uh, a lot of that has kind of stuck with the traditional telecom 10 gig, one gig, 100 gig, eventually 400 gig, and then they rate limit in software. Uh, so the internal connections, I think there's a lot more options than there are going to be for connecting to, say, carriers and stuff over time. But again, we've got a pretty wide variety of things to choose from in both spaces now. So to answer the question, what's the right interface type speed strategy for me? The answer is largely whichever meets your needs and requirements budget support model, right? You have to do an assessment of your own environment and figure out what you're going to need in a year, what you're going to need in two years, or maybe what you need next month. Um, and a big part of that is just knowing your network and understanding the landscape of, of what your uh, traffic patterns tend to trend towards. So I talked a lot about buffers, right? And um, that's one of the dark arts of networking. Not a lot of people know a whole lot about them. Um, but what I found is that there, uh, Jim Warner uh, out of a University of Santa Cruz in California has maintained this buffer page for many, many years. And it is sort of the de facto standard of where people go to figure out what gear has what buffers. Um, and it's been there forever. I talked to him not too long ago and he plans to keep it there even though he's retired and keep updating it as, as appropriate. Um, and if you're interested in going a little bit deeper and getting a little bit nerdier, you can check out the uh, fasterdata.es.net uh, for uh, testing your performance for uh, troubleshooting buffers and, and all kinds of different performance issues there. Again, you can find me um, at Forwarding Plane on social media, uh, or you can email me at braulio at forwardingplane.net. If you got any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Great. Thanks, Nick. I think when we get to the questions and stuff, there's probably going to be some people have some uh, interesting questions of where 25 gig and stuff fits in, in WISP network. So hopefully we can kind of circle back to that at the end of the, the end of yeah. the slides. So uh, with that, I uh, hand it over to Kevin to talk about uh, overlays and underlays. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dan. Um, so as Dan said, my name is Kevin Myers. I'm a senior network architect at IP Architects. And today we're going to spend a little bit of time going through overlays and underlays and how those are relevant to WISP networks. So one of the biggest things I think uh, before we get into the definitions there of, you know, of why we're doing this is WISPs are growing really, really fast with everything going on in the world uh, and the demand for data. Um, not that we didn't already have a huge demand for data uh, in the last few years, but now, especially in 2020, um, it's just enormous. So WISPs like wireline ISPs are trying to add services to really keep up with the pace. And so overlays and underlays are, are one of the ways that we can really address that um, to address some scaling needs and, and the ability to rapidly deploy services. And so that's one of the things I wanna get into and talk a little bit about today. So let's talk about what overlays and underlays are. And before I get into that, I'll kind of mention that these are newer terms. A lot of the things that we're gonna talk about like MPLS and VPLS and VXLAN and all these terms you're gonna hear about in the next few slides. Uh, traditionally, I've been in networking, I guess about 21 years, and people traditionally would just refer to them by the technology. They would say, we run an MPLS network, or we run a, a this network, or we use this tunnel. And so it's only been in the last few years with the rise of SD-WAN um, that you started to see these terms overlay and underlay coined. Um, and people have started to kind of collectively refer to anything that delivers a service on top of another routed network as uh, an overlay and something that's underneath as an underlay. And that's what we're about to, to get into, but to give you a little bit of a historical context there. So let's talk about what an underlay actually is. An underlay is the bottom layer that we use to transport the overlay services. Uh, it provides a layer of abstraction that we can use to focus just on reachability between endpoints um, so that we can deliver services. So it's really at its core, a routed network. And we may throw some other things in there like MPLS that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. Uh, but ultimately it's just a routed network that provides reachability for other services to go on top of. And I think one of the most important things that we talk about when we talk about any technology and network engineering is what problem are we trying to solve? And I think specifically here, one of the things we're trying to solve is isolation of traffic. That's huge, um, especially if you've got security concerns or you want to you want to manage your traffic better rather than dumping everything into the same 
routing table, um, isolation of traffic is huge with overlays and underlays. Um, transporting of other protocols um, is a big one. Ethernet's probably the most common, um, but we do in some WISPs in uh, remote parts of the world that have to depend on TDM services. It's possible to do things like ATM and frame relay still. Um, that still is used in production. Um, and one of the biggest things is reducing the touch points in the network. Um, by building an overlay underlay architecture in your WISP, you can reduce the number of things that you touch. And we're going to talk about that a little bit when we get into the justifications of why we do this. Um, but overall increases the flexibility of what you can do with your WISP and the services that you can deliver. So let's give a couple examples of what is an underlay. So you've heard me talk about MPLS, which um, fair warning, I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth on MPLS. So if MPLS is a new topic for you, I would strongly encourage you to go to the web and kind of dive into what MPLS is because we're just gonna give it a little bit of a cursory definition here as to how it's relevant. Um, and it's multi-protocol label switching, which was uh, first came about in like the 80s, late 80s, it was uh, uh, conceptualized and then got into prod somewhere in the 90s and became the de facto standard for service providers somewhere in the early 2000s. Pretty much every service provider on the planet has run MPLS at some point. Um, and I, I've seen in my 10 years in the WISP space, I've seen MPLS go from not used a whole lot to being um, probably 50% or better WISPs now use MPLS in some way inside of their networks. Um, and you can do that in two ways. You can use LDP, which is Label Distribution Protocol, or segment routing to form a label switched underway, underlay, which means that you're going to have a routed network, but on top of the routed network, uh, you're also going to have labels that are going to give you end-to-end -end reachability that you want to put services onto. And that's the core of what an MPLS underlay is. You have that label uh label path reachability so that you can deliver those services. Normally that's gonna be things like loopbacks and point-to-point -point subnets that you're gonna put in there for reachability. Um, and then we can talk about BGP. Um, BGP is, um, every year we seem to use BGP uh, more and more. Um, there's a big joke, um, guy by the name of Russ White is really uh, famous in the Cisco world, likes to joke that BGP is the trash can of the internet. Uh, because we stuff address families into it and all kinds of things into it. Uh, and it really is, but it's really, really flexible. It's a, and it's something that you can do a lot with. So um, with BGP, uh, you can do VPLS if you want to do BGP signal VPLS. You can do L3 VPN services, which are isolated routing tables and VRFs. Um, and you can even do EVPN, which is a more modern one that we're going to talk about, which allows you to get into things like the XLAN and Type 5 routes if you want to do L2, L3 overlays that are um, really more in the data center realm, but um, the Metro Ethernet forum has kind of specified that VXLAN EVPN is going to be the standard for service delivery for Metro Ethernet going forward. So we're starting to kind of see it make its way into the provider world. So I've got a drawing here that gives you just a basic overview. If you've never seen an MPLS network, and especially an MPLS WISP, if that's something that, that's new to you, this will give you at least a cursory overview if you've gotten the fundamentals of routing together of what this looks like. And at the heart of it, you take an IGP like OSPF or ISIS, which right here we have OSPF, and you create reachability between these routers at these towers. I've got three towers here. They're all strung up in a line, and I've got a couple slash 29 subnets between them. Um, and I don't have it pictured here, but we would have uh, some loopbacks. And you'd form a neighbor adjacency there, and then you would have basic OSPF routing reachability. And then on top of that, to get our label switching, which is the technology that allows these overlay services to actually work, um, we've got LDP, Label Distribution Protocol. Label Distribution Protocol is something that was developed in the late 90s that we use to um, basically manage those labels. Um, there's labels that are exchanged between each router, and while you can manage it manually, it's only something we really ever do in the lab because there's protocols to manage it and it would become unwieldy if you tried to do it manually. So we use LDP to do that. It's got some very basic requirements. Uh, it uses TCP 646, UDP 646, and it does require some multicast uh, to form those LDP neighbor adjacencies. And then you can build an MPLS forwarding table. So a slightly newer version of MPLS that we're starting to get into more and more, and I'm actually... <clears throat> excuse me, personally involved with deploying this on several wireless ISPs is segment routing. Um, and one of the interesting things about segment routing is that segment routing builds a more lightweight version of MPLS. So if you think about the example that I just went over, um, which is the um, LDP version of MPLS, 
in order to deploy that, you've got to deploy an additional protocol to get MPLS labels working between routers. With segment routing, it's built into the IGP. So in this case, I switched over to ISIS instead of OSPF. Um, and I've got segment routing running between these routers here and these towers, which means, among other things, I can deliver MPLS services. So any MPLS services that I want to deliver, I can put on there. Um, but I can also do some traffic engineering if I want to. One of the most interesting things, especially for WISPs, and this is something that um, I've talked about quite a bit, is traffic engineering inside of a wireless ISP. If you've got radio links that aren't uh, the full speed of what the physical connection is, if it's a gig connection and your speed over the air is, let's say, it's 650 meg, and you spider web a bunch of those paths together, that can be a very complex thing uh, to manage. And segment routing has made that far easier than any tool that we've had in the past um, to be able to do that. So when you use segment routing as to build your underlays for service delivery, you're also giving yourself some traffic engineering tools. Um, and it's uh, very, very basic as, as far as the most basic implementation. It uses what's called a segment ID, which is a 32-bit field in the header. And then the labels are the rightmost uh, 20 bits of that 32-bit segment ID that are exchanged between the routers so that you have label switching. So that's another way to do MPLS, which is another variation of an underlay. So let's look at probably one of the most traditional types of underlays, which is MPLS and IVGP. And this is probably the design that I've deployed the most into wireless ISPs over the years because it solves the most problems. So if you look at some of the things that we're doing here, we have all of the things that we had in MPLS. And then on top of it, we have BGP peered up um, with some kind of a route reflector in the middle there because we can add a few address families, which add more overlay capabilities to this underlay, um, namely VPN v4, which uh, serves L3 VPNs. And we're going to talk about that in a few slides and what that does, which is isolated routing tables. And then L2 VPN, which can uh, signal uh, things like BGP for VPLS. Or if you want to get into the newer stuff with VXLAN, you can also use the L2 VPN family with EVPN uh, to signal VXLAN and, and do things with that. So um, it gives you a bunch of options when you have an IBGP topology along with MPLS and an IGP. So the last diagram and overview um, that I'm going to go into for the underlay section is EBGP and VXLAN. And it's probably worth noting that you can actually deploy VXLAN over IBGP as well. Um, but I didn't want to confuse things too much because probably one of the most common deployments that we're seeing, at least the ones I've done in a WISP, which I haven't put VXLAN into many WISPs, but I put it into a few with Cumulus Linux. And EBGP is really by far the most common one that we're seeing um, because it's very, very easy to build VXLAN between EBGP autonomous systems. And you also have uh, some traffic engineering capabilities just by using BGP. So it builds a pretty nice underlay that's not too terribly difficult to manage uh, because you can strip all the private ASNs that I have in the drawing out here uh, and then just put it out as whatever your Aaron uh, ASN is. So, um, so that works pretty well. The other thing that's interesting about VXLAN is it doesn't require MPLS. Um, now, there are ways to pair it with MPLS, and a lot of service providers are doing that for data center interconnects, but technically, it just runs over IP. So if you don't have an MPLS foundation and you want to do something like an L2 overlay, which we'll get into what those are and why those are important here in just a second, um, that's a way that you can do it without having an MPLS forwarding table. Um, and that depends on your equipment, which is something that we're going to talk about. What, what does your equipment selection look like to build and use some of these protocols? So which underlay should I use? Um, and this is probably one of the most common questions that I get. And the answer that I almost always give to a WISP is probably to start with MPLS and LDP, um, along with um, setting yourself up for VPLS, which we'll talk about in the overlay section. MPLS, LDP, is it's simply the most common. It's the most available. It is the one that is, that is um, most readily available in all the WISP here. Um, it does have some limitations when it comes to traffic engineering, which is why if your business use case justifies getting some more expensive equipment to be able to support something like segment routing MPLS, um, I'm a strong proponent of that. And any of the new WISPs that I build, if we have a financial use case to justify um, getting the equipment to build uh, segment routing with MPLS, uh, 
then I normally will prefer that. But there's nothing wrong with using traditional MPLS with LDP. Uh, Microtik, for example, and Ubiquity, they both uh, support that, um, but they don't support segment routing, which is something something that we're going to talk about. So that's something that you need to think about if you're going to build your underlay is what's the compatibility across all my gear uh, and the investment there. And SRMPLS, the nice thing that I like about it is, even though it does cost a little bit more to get the equipment that supports segment routing, it simplifies the network. Um, you're not having to run multiple protocols to get MPLS working. You may turn on ISIS, which scales really, really well to a large number of towers. I mean, you could literally build the same IGP domain in ISIS with thousands of towers, even tens of thousands of towers without scaling out of ISIS. Um, and the third thing that we've got here in the underlay is BGP and EVPN. Um, and I have done that on a few WISPs. Um, the only challenge that you have is um, a lot of WISPs may have a, a lot of data center space and they may have a lot of controlled uh, space at their towers where they have racks where they can put a full, you know, full four post rack into a tower and put a piece of gear in there. And that's great. And you can leverage VXLAN. Um, it's not as common to find the equipment that is ready for the field. If you've got a really small tower, solar power, whatever, and you're getting into something where you have a lot of physical challenges, it's a lot harder to find gear that supports VXLAN. It's out there, but it's not as plentiful and it may be way more expensive. So that's why I have a comment here that says BGP VPN is leaving the DC and they are using it, but you do have to be mindful of, you know, what kind of gear you're selecting there. So like with everything, it comes down to your business requirements and the dollars there. Um, as far as the underlay protocols that you want to that you want to support, because the newer gear is more expensive, so you have to think about that. So let's talk for a minute about overlays. Um, we talked a lot about underlays, which is the foundation that you need to even run an underlay um, or an overlay, rather. But an overlay is is a type of network virtualization. It enables endpoint services. It's it's for lack of a better word, um, and I don't like to use this a lot, but it's like a tunnel. If you've ever built a tunnel in networking, whether it's an IPsec tunnel or a GRE tunnel, um, an overlay is very much like a tunnel. In fact, some people probably argue that it is a tunnel um, because it does have a lot of the properties. But overlays typically will encompass putting something like layer two or layer three inside of another packet, whether it's IP or MPLS, and then delivering it between endpoints. Um, and, and we've talked about VPLS, VXLAN, and L3 VPN. Those are all three very common overlay types that the underlay will transport that we use in the WISP world. So let's talk about VPLS, virtual private LAN switching. It's a layer two protocol. It's, its goal is to extend layer two out into the network. Now, if you're from a data center background or an enterprise background and you're watching this and you're new to WISP networking, you're probably gonna cringe when you hear me talk about extending layer two. And in service provider networking, it's a lot more common to extend layer two, but the difference is in the way in which we extend it. Um, you know, data center and enterprise networking, it's very common um, to argue against extending layer two, especially when it's hosts on the segment, which is a very reasonable justification to make. In service provider networking, um, extending layer two, there's a lot of good reasons to do it, especially when you're going to have routers consuming the layer two endpoints. And in this case, you're always going to have routers consuming the L2 overlays that we're going to talk about. So there's some good use cases here. And VPLS is probably one of the most common. Um, VXLAN is a newer format. It addressed a lot of scaling issues that VPLS had, which is why I think ultimately we'll see it replace VPLS over the long haul. Um, it's got a control plane for Mac learning. So rather than just learning and flooding Macs throughout the entire network and forcing those into the Mac table, uh, VXLAN has the ability to selectively learn Macs and only distribute them where they're needed so that um, if you have a large Mac table for some reason uh, in what you're building uh, because you're running larger data centers or whatever, um, you have the ability to not just completely exhaust the Mac tables on your switches. And it also has some better loop prevention technologies. Uh, when you deploy VXLAN, it's a lot easier to deploy two handoffs uh, at L2 towards a customer and not have to worry about looping. Um, whereas in VPLS, there's some specialized protocols we had to run or you had to do an active passive with scripting to be able to hand that off without worrying about looping. So VXLAN is definitely better in those two areas. Again, getting the equipment that supports it, we're still not quite there, um, except for people that have very specialized use cases. Um, and the one thing that we'll get an honorable mention here is Geneve. Um, Geneve is kind of a, a spinoff of VXLAN that's more for the compute world. Um, it's being embraced very heavily by VMware um, and some people in the data center. I'm not really gonna give it much airplay here because we haven't really seen a great use case for it in the WISP world, but it is a kind of a competing standard to VXLAN that is out there. And finally, layer three VPNs. Um, now we're gonna switch layers here. We've been talking about layer two 
we're going to move into layer three because we're going to build a routing table that is private. And we're going to put it on top of our overlay, which in this case is going to be an MPLS network because you do need an MPLS network to do an L3 VPN. Um, and that's something that allows you to build a private routing table for things like voice or your management network or your even your corporate network. I've seen some WISPs will take their corporate assets and make themselves the first customer and the first tenant so that all of their corporate locations are not mixing in with the global internet routing table of the WISP, and they'll just build themselves their own little MPLS cloud as their own uh, customer. And then it's worth noting that VXLAN can do this too through something called a type five route. So it's possible to build verse and exchange routes with VXLAN, um, but the mechanics of it are a little bit harder to do it than just straight L3 VPN. So for the time being, unless you're doing data center interconnects or you know cloud data center networking in the WISP world, L3 VPN is probably the better choice if you need to do isolated routing tables. So let's talk about use cases. Um, there's probably a hundred use cases we could talk about. I try to pick the ones that come up most commonly um, that we talk about. Public IPv4 aggregation is probably the number one use case for overlays in a WISP network. Most WISPs do not you know, start out with an enormous amount of prefixes um, or if they're new and they need to go get IPv4 prefixes that are public from Aaron or whoever their RAR is, um, it's very hard to get those right now. So in the old days, you know, we might break that up into slash 29s or 30s or what have you. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, that's um, that's something that we would take and maybe break up into smaller subnets. And you don't have to do that anymore. You can take that subnet back to a data center and you can aggregate it with a gateway in a data center and even fail it over to another data center. And then you can use VLANs and VPLS to extend that out to customers that need it so that you can be more efficient about that space. Um, I would say we've, we've done probably, oh, I don't know, dozens and dozens of WISPs that have that use case. And it works really, really well. Performance-wise, it's great. As long as you do your MTU math, it works really, really well. And that's probably the single most popular overlay solution for WISPs. Um, PPPOA aggregation, um, sometimes people kind of laugh because a lot of people don't use PPPOE anymore, but we still find it um, to be used quite a bit because it does embrace slash 32 networking. And in the world of IPv4, if you want to hand out single IPs and you've already built in a PPPoE radius system, um, it can still be a very good system. It's a very good authentication system. It allows you to do some things in authorization and authentication that are very, very hard to do in DHCP and Ethernet. Um, so that's one of the things that we'll use VPLS for is to aggregate PPPoE into a centralized data center. Full table peerings. If you want to be a transit provider uh, to your customers and you want to extend a circuit, rather than having to try to route those full tables all through your network, you can just use an overlay to extend a VLAN down to that customer, put a PE out there or bring them back to a PE in your data center. Um, and you can send a full table to them and it becomes very, very easy to do that versus uh, trying to route them through your entire network. Um, the next one, IBGP peerings, this is probably one of the most um, common things I see that is actually um, done wrong inside of um, WISP network architectures and network routing is a lack of full mesh peerings between the border routers um, that are on a directly connected subnet and not loopbacks. Um, when you're on loopbacks, um, you have a potential for route looping because the loopbacks, when looking for a default route, can actually just kind of ping pong back and forth between the border and the core where they came in. So one of the things we'll do to address that is we'll build a VPLS segment between all the data centers that's just for the BGP border routers to peer on. And that ends up working out really well because they can all peer to each other. So it doesn't matter where the traffic comes in, it will immediately take the correct next hop to the IP transit provider or IX that it needs to go to. And that works really well. Um, let's talk about all three VPNs for a second and use cases there. I would say private voice is probably one of the best ones. We've done it for TV. IPTV, like I said, management, corporate, customers, there's a whole bunch of reasons to do it. But voice is a really good one because voice can be tricky to secure. Um, anybody that's running voice is going to have their worst stories of somebody running up like, you know, 20, 30, $40,000 bill. And so if you can secure voice into a separate routing table um, where it doesn't ever mix into the internet and you have private IPs on phones that can go back to your SBC or wherever you're doing your SIP trunking, that can really make a huge difference in voice. And L3 VPN is a great technology to make that happen. Uh, so customer verf is the last one. And, um, in the customer verfs, the, uh, L3 VPN, um, is something that you can use to deploy for your customers. Um, in VPLS, if you're deploying VPLS, uh, 
uh, for more than a few locations, it can get really cumbersome. So uh, on all three VPNs, a better use case there. So um, if you look at here, this is, I won't go into an enormous amount of depth here, but VPLS for public IPv4 aggregation. Um, this is an example of what we just talked about. If I want to take a slash 24 and spread it across the network. And so I've got it built in here and you can see we've stretched that slash 24 using an L2 overlay all the way down to the end customer in the same subnet. So I did the same thing here, but it's with VXLAN. And with VXLAN, it's the same methodology. Uh, same methodology is you're doing an L2 overlay, you're encapsulating layer two and stretching it out. So it's the exact same thing we had in the other slide. We're just using a different L2 overlay technology to get there. And we just talked a little bit about the voice use case. And this is an example of what that would look like. We basically got three towers here that all have um, peers as a PE into this L3 VPN. And we've got our little SIP trunk, SBC box, whatever you've got in your data center that's got reachability into this L3 VPN cloud. And we've got an IP phone that's probably out at a customer premise here with the CE router. And we can ride this 192.168.3 network isolated from the internet global routing table, like all the way into the data center. And it works very well. It's very clean, very secure. Um, and it's a great way to do voice um, if you're worried about security. So probably one of the biggest questions we get is which overlay should I use? Um, I would say right now, VPLS is definitely the most common. Um, it has the widest support. That's what I would I would put my money into. Um, VXLAN is great. It does a lot of things, but as a WISP, you've really got to have kind of a strong use case to use it that's maybe outside the norm. Not saying don't, but um, the gear is a little more expensive, so you really have to kind of understand what you're doing there. Um, now, we'll say Microtik just added VXLAN support. A lot of WISPs use Microtik. I don't think Ubiquiti's added it yet. So there's a possibility um, that may have some inexpensive VXLAN gear that's coming, but that stuff's still in beta. Um, and L3 VPN is my choice over type five routes of VXLAN for L3 overlays, because again, the equipment is more readily available and it's a lot easier to deploy. The VXLAN type five takes a fair amount of work to, to get deployed. And if you recognize the slide from the underlays, it's the same thing with the overlays. It comes down to your business requirements and the dollars. So if you have a hard business requirement that justifies you to spend the money, you know, then it's not quote unquote expensive. Um, if you don't have that business requirement and you don't need that expensive technology to solve that business requirement, then you can kind of slide that budget in the gear that you select to fit the protocol that you need. So let's talk just briefly about why. Why do you do this? Because we talk a lot of times about uh, how do you do this, but let's talk about why you do this. Um, and I think one of the biggest things, my biggest uh, um, things that I tell WISPs is that this reduces touch points in the network. You can send a tech out to deliver a service and they don't have to touch uh, five routers or six routers or 15 routers in a network to get something plumbed through the network that's you know outside of the norms. Because normally a lot of the overlays tend to be specialized services, it's not the case with every WISP, but you don't wanna have to touch 15 routers to deploy a service. With overlays and underlays, you only have to touch the endpoint. So that's probably my single biggest uh, use case for that. Um, scalability, you can rapidly scale when you're using these technologies if you need to, which is a big deal in 2020. Flexibility, um, it allows you to remain flexible in what you do. You can you can take things that are messy and deal with them in a very elegant way. If you've got a merger, um, if you bought another WISP and you need to bring that WISP in, underlays and overlays can be invaluable into digesting that into your network. We've already talked about traffic engineering. Having those capabilities underneath is, is a really important thing for WISP. It gives you a lot of uh, capabilities to maneuver your traffic. And so selecting underlays that have that is, is an important thing for WISP. Security, um, and the thing about security here is even if you don't have security requirements that you're as a startup WISP or maybe you're two or three years in, you don't know when a customer is gonna come to you and hit you with something where they need compliance and regulatory like um, HIPAA or PCI or one of those things. So having the overlay and underlay separation allows you to immediately address that without having to redesign your network. And the biggest thing is it lowers risk. Um, you know, if you're not touching as much of your network because you've built a core out as an underlay and then attach overlay services to it, you're not having to touch everything all the time, which lowers the risk when you're making changes. So I'll talk briefly about vendor selection. I think we're getting close to wrapping up here. Um, it's really, really important to figure out what your business requirements are and what it is you want to build and what kind of services you want to deliver and go through these, these uh, intangible things that you know that you want in your WISP and then select a vendor that supports those protocols. Very often we'll see 
Um, you know, people that want to start a wisp and say, Hey, I got five micro ticks because they were 50 bucks a piece. Um, and I got five ubiquity APs and I'm ready to go. And, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. You'll kind of make your way through, but if you spend some time planning on what you need and you look at these vendors, um, for what it is that they offer, you can select the right thing. And all the vendors on here do a good job in the West world. We've used all of them to build networks. It's really understand the strengths that each vendor has and make sure that your, your design is using those vendors for each of their strengths um, in the place that you put it in the network. And you don't necessarily have to have all one vendor. You should really pick the vendor that solves the problem well and then go through the time to interrupt them appropriately. And then you're not going to get stuck into the one vendor approach. So um, I think that's an important thing to, to consider. So I've got a couple quick notes here that you can read afterwards. Got some podcasts, uh, my blog, Nick's blog, and some groups that, uh, that you can go to. And then uh, that's where you can find me at Subbury51 on Twitter and Kevin Myers at IPArchitects.com. And I think that's it for me. I'm going to turn it back over to Dan. Great. Uh, thanks, guys. There's tons of good information there. I think we'll have uh, lots of questions um, for, oops, I look like I skipped a slide. Lots of questions for uh, Nick and Kevin in the, the discussion section. So uh, after the video ends, you can jump over there and we can continue the discussion. Um, before you go, uh, your code for this session is CORE2020. You get your 25 points for the contest and stuff on the left-hand side. So um, thank you for your time. Thanks for uh, Nick and Kevin for spending the time uh, with us now. And if you're interested in any of these topics, uh, again, please join the discussion for the session. I think that should uh, likely go on for a good little while after we end here. So thank you very much for joining. Thank you for tuning into this session at the WISP Virtual Summit, proudly presented by Perseem. Perseem is a unique networking solution that helps WISPs measure, analyze, and optimize the quality of experience they deliver to their subscribers. Perseem helps WISPs lower churn, reduce support calls, and increase revenue. To learn more, visit perseem.com.